Welcome back. Officials in Somalia say at least three children have been killed by airstrikes after their school was hit in the town of Sakao. The school is run by the militant Islamist group Al-Shabaab, which controls the area in the southern parts of the country. The main hospital in the district was also hit and is said to have been destroyed. There are reports that two senior members of Al-Shabaab were in the area, but it's not clear what happened to them. The United States and Kenya carry out frequent airstrikes in the region. In South Africa, conservationists want a shellfish highly prized by restaurants in China, abalone, to be listed as endangered as they have been nearly wiped out by poachers. A 2016 report found that the value of illegal abalone trading was estimated at 57 million US dollars. Here's more on the story. South African police storm a house in Johannesburg where suspected abalone poachers are believed to be holed up. A toxic mix of poverty and organized crime has unleashed a poaching wave threatening the large sea snail coveted as a delicacy and that is critical to the ecological health of coastal waters. A report released by Traffic, a wildlife trade monitoring network, found that the region's abalone population is on the verge of collapse, with an estimated 96 million illegally harvested between 2000 and 2016 to feed Asian markets. For the last five or more, or more years, the amount of abalone that's come out of the water illegally is more than 95%. That means only about 5% or less of what is fished has been legally fished. The rest has been poached. And over the last 20 years, there's been, on average, one seizure or um, arrest or similar incident related to abalone every single day of the year. So imagine that for 20 years, almost daily, there is an abalone poaching related arrest. And we're only catching a small proportion of uh, the people involved in the abalone that's related to those poaching incidents. The report also says that only around a third of abalone taken from southern Africa waters that reaches restaurant tables is legal. According to the South African National Biodiversity Institute, abalone plays an important ecological role. The species help to keep coastal waters clean by feeding on seaweed and floating weeds. It would seem that the, um, the risk-reward ratio still is you know, far in favor of the, the poachers and the traders because um, it is, there's clearly many, many people involved. It's really it's a, it's a well-organized, well-resourced business that generates a significant amount of revenue. Only a limited number of fisheries are licensed to harvest a highly circumscribed amount of abalone in South Africa, and the penalties for breaking the law are harsh, but this has not deterred poachers. For Chinese people, when we celebrate weddings and major events, why will we choose to serve abalone? It is because putting it on the table celebrates the prestige of the occasion. Normally, there will be different things, including shark fin. But these days, people are more environmentally conscious, and they may choose bird's nest instead. And if there is abalone, the event will be even more prestigious. The host will also gain more face. Dubbed white gold after its pearly flesh, about 90% of the region's abalone is destined for upscale restaurants in Hong Kong. Traffic is calling for stricter trade rules on South African abalone to protect them and ensure their survival. As the fight against Ebola continues, a group of students from Stanford University are working on making protective suits for healthcare workers less heat generating. The research was prompted by healthcare workers from Sierra Leone who experienced intense heat while wearing a suit that protected them from the highly infectious Ebola virus. Keeping cool for long enough in protective suits, an essential kit for firefighters and health workers can be a challenge. This reality prompted a team of California's Stanford University students working on the regulation of body temperature to create a cooling system that could double the amount of time workers can spend wearing protective suits. 
do what I said, okay? I Craig Heller, professor of biology at the School of Humanities and Sciences, says that health and aid workers reported that they are only able to stay in those wares for just between 20 to 30 minutes before overheating. Overheating puts them at risk of illnesses like heat stroke and limits their mental and physical capabilities. This is a concern for workers who could be exposed to a deadly virus, especially with new outbreaks of Ebola virus in Democratic Republic of Congo this year. The cooling system developed by the Stanford researchers looks like a hydration pack used in sports like running or cycling. One bladder contains frozen water and lies next to another holding circulating fluid. Tubes from the backpack deliver cooling fluid through pads in the underside of fingerless gloves. A valve in the tubing of the system mixes warm fluid returning from the gloves with the colder fluid from the bladder, allowing the temperature of the glove to be regulated. The system has been tested on undergraduate students wearing similar protective suits to those worn by Ebola health workers walking briskly on treadmills with different gradients. Some wore the cooling system and others did not, and they could stop walking at any time. However, they had to stop either when their heart rate reached 95% or after 40 minutes, whichever came first. Their nose temperature was measured with a 60 centimeter probe inserted into their mouth or nose. In these lab conditions, the cooling system allowed the students to spend at least double the time being active than without it, and some tripled or quadrupled the time spent being active. The team is working on a prototype that can be mass-produced and is continuing to study the effect of overheating on cognition. Well, that's it on the program. Thanks for watching. I'm Teniola Shibueli.